This is a girl. The girl is lying on a towel. The towel is lying on the grass. The grass grows in Hollywood, which tells you immediately and very clearly where our picture is laid. <laughs> the girl's name is Frosty. She's a bit player in motion pictures, which means that uh, she plays a little bit here and uh, a little bit there. She lives in a bungalow court like many of the natives. It is always pleasant to watch the development of bit players because some of them become stars. Uh, their careers depend mostly on their talents. Crystal gazing will never take the place of girl gazing, will it? As a matter of fact, it is one of our male natives' favorite pastimes. Uh, they call it the once-over. Well, friends, have a good look at Frosty because, unfortunately, we won't see much of her in our picture. Our story is the story of one of her neighbors. His name is Beauregard Bottomley, the last scholar. And in the constant pursuit of knowledge, he reads and reads and reads. His cornflakes in the morning are well sprinkled with Schopenhauer. His blue plate at lunch is balanced with a generous helping of the latest developments in atomic research. And absolutely nothing can disturb his brilliant mind. Very good, Gerald. You're coming along nicely. Once more, please. Back to the music! Back to the old season. Does Polly want a cracker? Polly wants a drink! Let's get loaded! Just the darndest things, doesn't he? How about a short one? How about a short one? I've had your quota for the day, Caesar. As I've told you before, Gerald, neither my sister nor I taught him these expressions. His former master must have been the greatest reprobate since the Emperor Nero. We found him one night leaning up against a lamppost. He couldn't remember where he lived. Uh, he still can't. Now we have him down to two drinks a day. Soon we'll have him down to no drinks a day. <coughs> now you have frightened him. Look, Caesar. Caesar. <coughs> Champagne! Oh, no, no, no. Sorry, you must rub it for a while. Do you mind if we cut the lesson short tonight, Gerald? We'll make it up next time. Beauregard and I are going to a show. Oh, that's all right. I'll get ready. You know, Gerald, I can't help admiring your enterprise. Your late approach to the art of music is highly commendable. I wish you many happy hours at the piano. Oh, oh I don't want to learn to play the piano. Really? Well, isn't your procedure of taking piano lessons rather roundabout for one who does not wish to play the piano? I only want to learn how to play jingle bells. Oh, well, then, then I wish you many happy hours playing Jingle Bells. By the way, if you've nothing better to do, why not join Gwen and myself? It may turn out to be a very exciting evening. I've nothing better to do. Fine. As a matter of fact, I've nothing at all to do. Skip the gutter. Ladies and gentlemen, this is indeed a thrilling milestone in the history of cosmic science. For the first time over television, we shall make an attempt to shoot the moon by radar. It's ought to be worth seeing. It's thrilling, Beauregard. The beam will bounce off the surface of the moon and come racing back through the heavens to this laboratory. The elapsed time of this stratospherical round trip will be 2.564 seconds. Wait a moment, that doesn't sound right. 239,000 miles to the moon, light travels 186,300 miles a second. 186,300 into twice times 239, that'd be 5.565. Five. Oh, yes. The total elapsed time will be 2.565. It's a perfectly understandable mistake. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. I shall now release the radar ray. <laughs> Cosmic message. Sounded more like a cosmic raspberry. <laughs> yes, you may be right, Gerald. It could very well be the moon's unflattering opinion of man's puny efforts. Next week, we will continue our regular program, Adventures in Science. Good night, all. I guess we just made it. I'm afraid you've come a little late. However, I'll be very happy to explain what has just occurred. As you know, an electronic phenomenon. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. Ho, ho. Ho, ho! What time is it? It's happy morning time! <laughs> yes, sir, it's happy Hogan time and masquerade for money, that number one coast-to-coast -coast quest for dough. Now televised locally and brought to you by 
My lady, the soap that sanctifies. My lady, my lady, the soap for a lady. It's creamy, it's sunny. Nauseating. Oh, Mr. Bottomley, I almost didn't recognize you without your book. You remember Frosty? She lives next door. Oh, yes, I hardly recognized you without your, I mean, in your present attire. Oh, I didn't know you were a happy Hogan fan, Gwen. I I'm not. I don't even know the man. Oh, I know him personally. He's a dreamboat and so smart. And here he is now. That joyful, jolly, jestful, jivey joker. That merry, mad, mirthy mincer of magpies. Whatever that means. That querulous, quizzical, quintessence of query. Happy Hogan. Hi, you kid. Hi, yeah. Yes, sir. Fasten your seatbelt. Zip in your straitjackets because tonight we're going to break it down. We're going to kick it around and we're going to throw money all over it. We bid a bon voyage to this dreamboat and quietly steal away. This is one of those quiz programs, Beauregard, where people win things. Let's watch it for a while. It might be fun. For the one or two people who may not be familiar with the program, Masquerade for Money is a real-life costume party, and here's how we play the game. Yes, sir, the audience appears in a costume representing his or her favorite person, object, thing, or animal. Contestants are asked questions about the person or thing their costume represents. We pay $5 for the first question, $10 for the second question, and so on until the sixth question, which pays the lovely loot of 160 clinkers. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, and at any time during the evening, a contestant can pocket the dough and go home happily. And now let's go laughing and scratching. Who's our first contestant? Oh, isn't she a lovely little thing? <laughs> this guy kills me. <laughs> Who are you supposed to be? I am Cleopatra. What's your name in real life, Cleo? Where are you from? My name is Lona Kransky, and I come from Brooklyn. Brooklyn! I fail to see why the location of birth should be met with applause. But she comes from Brooklyn. Oh. Here's your first question, Cleo. Now, here we go. Down what river did you float? On your barge. Oh, that's a tough one. The Nile? That is right. That's absolutely right. You're now the proud possessor of five drachmas. When how can you stand such drivel? Would you please shut up? Yes, but I can't let this go on without a word of warning. This man is the forerunner of intellectual destruction in America. If it is noteworthy and rewarding to know that two and two make four to the accompaniment of deafening applause and prizes, then two and two making four will become the top level of learning. Good evening. Gee, Mr. Bottomley, you sure know a lot. I not only sure know a lot, my dear Frosty, I know everything. Yes, Mr. Brown, I know everything. Everything except what is commonly known as how to make a buck. It certainly isn't easy to place a scholar, Mr. Bottomley. No, it isn't. No, I've been a short order cook, a shoe salesman, and heaven knows what else. But if you know everything, you're not wanted around for long. <laughs> and Greek translations don't pay very much. You know, I may have something here that's right up your intelligent alley. Oh? This company is looking for a man who is exactly your type. Something to do with a research survey. Why don't you take this card and go see what it's all about? It's the My Lady Soap Company. My lady. Isn't that the, uh, the soap that sanctifies? <laughs> yes, that's the one. The soap that sanctifies. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't afford to be choosy. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Sorry I'm such a problem. Good afternoon. I was sent here by the...
We were expecting you. Please approach the desk and fill in the application blank. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a nice place, you. <laughs> Good afternoon. As I was saying to the other gentleman. Saying to the other two gentlemen, I. Uh... Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Would you follow me, Mr. Bottomley? Yes. Yeah. You signed the application, put it in the slot. Very little is known about this position, Mr. Bottomley, except that it has something to do with a survey. <laughs> Actually originated in the office of the top executive, Mr. Burnbridge Waters. It's all very hush hush, and we simply refer to it as Operation Lather. The salary will be forty dollars a week. Well, that's satisfactory, but not not conducive to luxury living. Shall we go up to the penthouse? extremely valuable. Seconds tick away into minutes, minutes become hours, hours disappear into days and weeks, weeks suddenly form months, and months have a habit of becoming years. Well, I've never quite looked at it that way, but I suppose you're right. This is a Mr. Bottomley, Mr. Waters. He hopes to become a member of my lady's family. PhD, physicist extraordinary. BA, BS, master's degree at the age of 13. Rhodes Scholar. PhD, DSC, LLD. All this spells one thing to me, sir. You are a dreamer, I am a doer. Do we have that straight? Oh, yes, quite, quite. I have an idea. I want to find out what the average man thinks of it. Then when we find out what he thinks of it, we'll uh, change his thinking. Change his thinking, naturally. What I am about to tell you now is very top secret. It ranks with the discovery of electricity and the invention of the wheel. I am thinking of putting on the market an all-purpose cake of soap that will also be used to clean teeth. I see. Sort of, uh, <laughs> sort of uh, foam-at-the-mouth approach, eh? <laughs> you would have started tomorrow morning. Well, that would have been fine, but aren't we using rather a strange tense? Would have? No, sir, we are not. I loathe humor, and you are humorous. 
Well, if it's just a pleasantry designed Mr. To Waters work, hates uh, pleasantries, I suppose I should have told you. Oh, well, I'm sorry to have offended you, Mr. Waters. It was unintentional and shan't occur again. However, I really need a job, and if I may say so, I think I would be definitely useful to your highly reputable firm. I am afraid of you, sir. You would be a poor ambassador of goodwill for my lady. This is a deadly serious world, this world of business. And at some given moment, you would probably revert to type. Oh, but surely... Why is the interrupting? I... I didn't indicate that I had finished talking, did I? I saw no sign of it, sir. Uh, oh, I... I beg your pardon. You are the intellectual type. I despise intellectual types. You are an improvident grasshopper, and I am an industrious squirrel. <laughs> Nothing personal. Well, just a moment. What I have to say is quite personal. If you are a squirrel, you're a very nutty one. You are also an unmitigated pompous ass and an expensive moron. It's no use, Mr. Bottomley. Mr. Waters is no longer on this plane with us. Shall we steal away? Oh. Do I genuflect upon leaving, or...? Or just face Mecca. That's all. He's very cute, don't you think? Burnbridge Waters discovered him. Did you get the job? May I congratulate you? Uh, no, I, I didn't get the job, but uh, congratulations may be in order. I, I believe I have the greatest idea since the discovery of Happy Hogan. And now our next contestant. <laughs> are you supposed to be a bookie? <laughs> Seriously, what are you supposed to represent? I am the encyclopedia. And the monocle? A Britannica. Oh, in that case, I can ask you anything about anything, and if we can ask you anything about anything, I will ask you anything about anything. I'm sure if you ask the questions, that'll be a very limited field. <laughs> well, uh, may I ask your name? You may. Well, well, what is your name, then? Beauregard Bottomley. Would you, would you mind repeating that again? I would mind, very much. <laughs> oh, Beauregard Bottomley it is, then. Well, on to the questions, but first... Here are your six cakes of my lady soap. The soap that removes the dirt like any other soap. <laughs> I know this man. He's a disappointed office seeker and assassin. He's a saboteur from Life Boy. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes. Here we go for the first question and five dollars. What is the name of the first animal described in the Encyclopedia Britannica? The aardvark, spelled double A-R-D-V-A-R-K. The aardvark is an anteater. That is absolutely right. You are now the proud possessor of five dollars. By the way, you said an aardvark is an anteater. Is he also an uncle eater? <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, the aardvark is an uncle eater. Uh, but he only eats the uncles of the ants. <laughs> Ludwig van Beethoven. Born 1770, died 1827. That is absolutely correct. John Jay was the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. That is absolutely correct. Theta is the eighth letter of the Greek alphabet. That is absolutely correct. 60 home runs hit by Babe Ruth. That is absolutely correct. Here we go for the last question. Which is farthest east? Las Vegas, Los Angeles, or Reno? Las Vegas, Nevada. That is absolutely right. Yes, sir, you certainly did all right for yourself tonight, Mr. Encyclopedia. Here are $160 in folding money. Uh, why don't you ask me another question? Uh, don't be nervous. <laughs> Well, all right. If the audience wants us to ask you another question, we'll ask you another question. But let me warn you, it's not going to be an easy one. And here we go for $320 or nothing. You have five seconds to tell us the Japanese word for goodbye. One, two. Sayonara. 
Not to be confused with cyanide, which is, of course, goodbye in any language. That is right. Uh, uh, yes, you are absolutely correct. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in the history of Masquerade for Money, a contestant has nicked us for $320. And here is your money. No, thank you. Now, wait a minute. Really? We're running out of time. No more questions, no more time. Well, that's all right. I'll come back next week when you have more time. Thank you very much, folks. Your encouragement has been my inspiration. I'll see you all next week, if they'll allow me on the program. You'll be back on, Mr. Bonnelly. You'll be back on, Mr. Bonnelly. Next week, $640. Yes, I know, but don't you see? They won't even let you on the show next week. Why didn't you take the $320? Because if the plan I have in mind works, in the future, we shall only patronize the $100 window at the Bank of America. Oh, my God, don't you see? Uh, careful, Gwen, the enemy approaches. Say, uh, Miss Bottomley, fun's fun and all that, but I think you better take your money and forget about next week. Mr. Hogan, may I please have your autograph? Sure. Oh. Why do you want a signature? One X looks like another. <laughs> Is there something special about me you dislike, Mr. Bottomley, or do you hate me for myself alone? Oh, I don't hate you, Mr. Hogan. He merely thinks you're the forerunner of intellectual destruction in America. Yes, <laughs> nothing personal. Uh, well, since it seems uh, nobody's going to introduce me to anybody, I'd better introduce myself. I'm Beauregard's sister Gwen. I wouldn't let the news get around. Good night, you two. Don't think it hasn't been charming. It's a shame we'll never meet again. You'll never be more spotless, Gwen. You've been thoroughly brushed off. I think he's quite amusing. Did you notice his wonderful smile? Did I? I feel I know personally each one of his teeth. It's the greatest idea since The Walking Man. I'm glad I thought of it. We'll uh, stretch him out over a period of six weeks by asking him only one question a week. Yes, sir. Pull out all stops on publicity. Yes, sir. Build up our audience and our rating. Generate a terrific sales campaign. Yes, sir. Play up our extreme generosity and then knock him off. You ask me, I think we ought to pay him off right now. Nobody asked you. You were paid to entertain, not to think. Happy may have a thought there. You know, this is a dangerous precedent we're establishing. This order weakens the size of our top price, $160. Not only that, but... I'm afraid it's no use, Chuck. I believe he's no longer with us. And tonight you're answering a question for $40,000 or nothing. Please take the $40,000 if you win tonight. Please take it. I will not. But do you realize what we can do with $40,000? Well, we can do twice as much with $80,000, four times as much with $160,000. But they won't let you go on like this, Beauregard. It, it can't go on. They'll do something. And besides, just one mistake, one little mistake, and we'll, we'll wind up with nothing. I don't believe I've done anything to justify your lack of confidence in me. Oh, Gwen. Are you sure I'm the only reason for your highly nervous condition? I don't know what you're talking about. Well, the fact that Happy Hogan has paid no attention to you, I would consider a compliment. I still don't know what you're talking about. Hmm. Look, this will take your mind off whatever your mind is on. Rock formations in Death Valley. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> 
these questions are not only hard, they're mean. <laughs> uh, let's ask it this way. <laughs> well, if it isn't the brain. And another sister. I'm Gwen, remember me? Oh, yes. I didn't recognize you at first. You have a new hairdo or something. Beauregard Bottomley, Burnbridge Waters. Miss Bottomley, Burnbridge Waters. How do you do? Oh, yes, I've met Mr. Waters. In the well-upholstered torture chamber where he practices witchcraft over a bar of soap. Excuse me. Mr. Bottomley, I would like to thank you. Through you, we have A, increased our rating. B, gotten quite a bit of publicity. And C, we have doubled our sales. D, I couldn't hear better news. E, I hope the sales increase even more. And F, it would frighten you if you knew why I felt this way. Ugh. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to that portion of Masquerade for Money, reserved for Mr. Beauregard Bottomley. <laughs> please. Will he be right? Or will he be wrong? All the world wonders because tonight Beauregard Bottomley is shooting for $40,000 or nothing. And now, here comes that grown-up quiz kid. <laughs> well, where's your encyclopedia? We'll see. How you feeling tonight, Mr. Bottomley? Um, Kind of nervous? Well, why should I be nervous? It's your money. You're losing it. I'm only winning it. Ah, uh -huh. I've seen tonight's question. You'll be sorry. Uh, suppose you stop all this nonsense and just ask me the question, hmm? Hmm. You, Mr. Bottomley, have only to name the second emperor of the Ming dynasty. That's all. Of course, it was Chu Yun Wen. He was dethroned by his uncle, who became the third emperor. Strange enough, the third emperor had three names. Chu Ti, Cheng Tsiu. That's enough. He wins again! <laughs> quiet, quiet, please. Mr. Bottomley, here is your check for $40,000. Uh, thank you, no money. I shall return. Well, gentlemen, there's no denying the fact we're in a very tight spot. I now believe that we have a Frankenstein on our hands. A very well-informed Frankenstein. He must be stopped. You're absolutely correct, B.W. The question is... Don't use the word question. Our course is now clear. We've received value for value. We've certainly gotten $40,000 worth of prestige, publicity, build-up, and sales. I am now ready to pay off this man, and that will be the end of that. <laughs> That's a great idea, Burnbridge. The only trouble is it won't work. Mark my words, next week, Beauregard Bottomley will be shooting for $80,000. That's great. You jackhead! Thank you, thank you, and good evening, Burnbridge Waters. I'll be seeing you, Come kids. back here, Hogan. You're in this right up to your options. This could very well be the end of radio, for which you would be directly responsible. Who, me? You think I enjoy being Joe Schmo from Kokomo each week and having this joker top me with his insults? I don't like it any better than you do. What do you expect me to do? Go out and shoot him? <laughs> no. No, we mustn't start thinking like that. Why don't you just refuse to let him on the show? Let me explain something to you, my dear. If we take Mr. Bottomley off the show, the people who listen to our show wouldn't like the idea. If they don't like the idea, they won't listen to our show. If they don't listen to our show, our sales will drop to nothing and we will lose money! <laughs> I didn't upset you, my dear. Now, let me tell you, we must bore from within. What do we know about Beauregard Bottomley? What is he up to? Who was the woman in his life? Where are his weaknesses? Where is he most vulnerable? Where can we reach in and twist? There's very little to go on, Chief. No weaknesses, no woman, no nothing. No hits, no runs, no arrows. <laughs> <laughs> he lives in a piano with his sister who gives bungalow lessons. Oh. Uh, uh, uh. No such thing as a man without a weakness. There must be something. Maybe I can get some inside information for you, Burnbridge. Uh, care to treat me to a few piano lessons? Mm. 
<laughs> I love this boy. I discovered him. He's one of the greatest men in radio. <laughs> boring holes in the back of my skull. Hi. Mr. Hogan, you are most unwelcome here. He's taking lessons. Uh, my dear Happy Hogan, at the last count, there were 10,482 piano teachers in Greater Los Angeles. Your appearance here suggests an ulterior design. But I think he's really interested in the piano, and I'd like us to continue what we've started with the piano. Uh, Gwen, my dear, you are unwise in the ways of the world. This insidious instigator of infamy stands poised at my vitals with a knife of treachery. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. And the ridiculous idiom of your profession, get lost. Am I to understand that you want me to leave? Don't answer that. It's been a charming afternoon up to a point. And at this point, I'm leaving. I refuse to let you interfere with my business. I am not your child, I am not your wife. I am your sister, and I'll give piano lessons to Gargantua if I wish to. I would have no objections to Gargantua. Gwen, surely it must be apparent to you that this Hogan fellow isn't interested in music? Of course not. Do you think I'm an idiot? Ah, then you admit that his motives are shady. My lady's soap and Burnbridge waters are obviously panicked. They want me off the air, or they want to stump me. It just doesn't occur to you that he may be interested in me, does it? Oh, Gwen. I know that you've a mild crush on Hogan, but I know also that until today he paid no attention to you. Sometimes these things take time. Even last night when you preened your feathers in a supreme effort to enchant him, he remained, if I may say so, Rather unenchanted, didn't he? Perhaps I made a delayed impression. Very unlikely. No, my dear. Hogan came here to look for my weak spot, for my Achilles heel. I suppose you're right. Then there's no need to see him again, is there? No. No need. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your letting me see you. I know your brother would object. Violently. Your brother's a very intelligent man, but he doesn't seem to know anything about love. Tell me, Gwen, isn't there some woman in his life? Not at the moment. You see, Beauregard wants a woman who's not only beautiful, but brilliant. Kind of hard to find. Kind of. I'm lucky. I found one. You know, my brother thinks you're seeing me in order to get some information about him. I think so, too. The words, I'm a heel. Not in other words. Same words. Then why did you come here? Why did you let me kiss you? Because I like you very much. You like me even though you think I'm a heel? Mm-hmm. Isn't it awful? I, I think you're the most terrific girl I've ever met in my life. Sounds wonderful. I really mean it. You and your brother were both right. I did come looking for information. And I'm glad. 
glad I did. Because I found something really important. You know, I want him to stop, too. I wish he'd take the money because we need it, but he won't. He's out to get them. He has estimated that Milady Soap Company is worth $40 million. When he wins $40 million, he'll stop. Stop. Happy boy, I knew you'd do it. How did it go? Fine. I'm seldom grateful to anybody, but I've certainly got to hand it to you. Put it here, boy, put it here. It was your idea, and it turned out great. What's the score, happy boy? As for Beauregard Bottomley having a personal weakness, he has none. There are no vices, there's no woman at the moment. What are you telling me, boy? Why are you letting me shake your hand? Did he agree to stop? His sister wants him to stop. Oh, great, great, that old Hogan touch. Sit down. You uh, convinced her? Well, I didn't have to. You see, she's felt this way all along. However, she doesn't have the slightest influence on her brother. Why are you telling me my idea is so great, you knuckle knob? What are you so happy about? I fell in love with Gwen Bottomley. How dare you fall in love on my time? This is dishonest, treacherous, and un-American. Get out of here! Don't you want to know what Beauregard Bottomley is up to? Better get your pills out, Burnbridge. Hold on to your hat. Do you know what Bottomley wants? He wants your blood, and he has it figured out at $40 million worth. He's after every nickel and dime, every building and factory, every hunk of stock, every bar and flake of soap, every stick of furniture, all the executives, in fact, everything that belongs to Milady Soap Company. This is George Fisher in Hollywood. Here's something hot. News has just come in off the wire that the contest we've all been following feverishly is now over. Masquerade for Money is off the air. A check for $40,000 has been given to Beauregard Bottomley, and that seems to be that. Now, the latest news from the film colony is that... But wait. Here's a new development, ladies and gentlemen. Beauregard Bottomley has refused, I said refused, the check for $40,000. What he hopes to gain by this, I don't know, but I beg you one and all, especially the members of the Beauregard Bottomley fan clubs, not to telephone this station. We'll bring you the latest news as soon as it flashes across our wires. In the meantime, we'll all await further developments. Now, on to the Hollywood news. <laughs> Will you look this way, Mr. Bottomley? Three cheers for Beauregard Bottomley! Hip <laughs> Now, Mr. Bottomley, would you mind telling us why you refused the $40,000 offered to you by the Masquerade for Money program? I refused the $40,000 simply because I have no intention of ending the contest. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> but, Mr. Bottomley, the program is no longer on the air. Well, I'm sure that Masquerade for Money will be on the air again very shortly, and I will be on the program. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Tremendous acclaim proves I am not alone in my fight to end the Stonehead Age. And the public will see to it that I continue. <laughs> ah, there's good news tonight after all. Masquerade for Money is going back on the air. And the reason for that decision can be told in just two words. No soap. Not one bar of My Lady's Soap was sold over the counters of America since Beauregard Bottomley was forced off the air. And so once again, Mr. and Mrs. John Public prove their word is final. The frequency of a bat's shriek is somewhere around 20,000 cycles a second. That is absolutely correct. The upper Cretaceous deposits of the Elbrus mountain region of Persia consist of limestones, locally hipparitic, and fossiliferous marls, often bituminous. That is absolutely correct. The molar of an
an Asiatic elephant has 24 plates. That is roughly correct. Roughly. Well. one of the first people in this country to think of quiz programs. I discovered Happy Hogan. I dreamed up Masquerade for money. I could have hired Beauregard Bottomley for $40 a week. I wanted him to continue on the show. It's all my fault. But I won't admit it even to myself. Mr. Waters! Mr. Waters! Beauregard Bottomley's in the building. He's demanding to be shown through the plant. He says he wants to acquaint himself with his future holdings. Throw him out, destroy him, have him arrested! No, wait a minute. Now let him in. Of course. <laughs> That's the way to do it. Let him in. You're not thinking of doing anything desperate, are you? You do care for me, don't you? How sweet of you. Remind me to ask you later what you're doing to me. <laughs> Five degrees centigrade, I presume. And you're replacing the hydrogen of an acid with a hydrocarbon radical. How do you know? Oh, oh, how silly of me to ask you that. Well, I can't be expected to do everything. But you know that one gesture of yours, that one gesture shows me that you are a man of tremendous executive ability. I've just had the greatest idea since the discovery of fire. I will bathe the world physically, and you will cleanse it mentally. Together, we will bring about a spotless, sparkling world. How does it hit you? Well, if I understand you correctly, you are offering me a job? Not a job, the vice presidency. It's as though Caesar had joined forces with Alexander the Great. Yes, well, they were 300 years apart. Never mind. I am prepared to offer you not only the vice president. You are prepared to offer me nothing. Frankly, my dear Burnbridge, you are living on borrowed soap flakes. I see. Well, this doesn't come as a surprise to me. My house is in order. I have prepared myself. I find that very difficult to believe. Beauregard, I like you. I like you because you are an honest man. And it's because I like you that I feel I must now warn you. You were headed for trouble. You were about to link arms with misery. Well, aren't you going to ask me why? Then I will tell you why. Beauregard, it's terrible to have money. It's frightening to be wealthy. It's disastrous to be loaded. Do you know what I have to show for my life's work? Pills. Green pills to be taken after yellow pills. Purple pills to be taken before green pills. Ulcers and nerves. Ulcers that shriek. Nerves that jingle, jangle. Jingle. Jingle. Well, money won't buy you a new stomach. Right. Can't make you sleep at night. Right. Oh, you are so brilliant. Taxes, stocks, bonds. Payrolls, upkeep, bills. Right, Beauregard. But don't let them do it to you. I can take it. I don't count anymore. They've wrecked me. But don't let it happen to you. How can I ever thank you, Burnbridge? Oh, don't thank me, Beauregard. Just stay as you are. Walk out of here into the sunshine of a carefree world, wise in the knowledge that I have bestowed upon you. For it is my sincere conviction that the only way to be happy is to be poor. My dear Burnbridge, I see your point. I am about to make you the happiest man in the world. Get 
out of here, you thief. Get out of this building immediately. And when I take over in two weeks, let's do it quietly. No reception, please. And clean up the plant, won't you? Goodbye. I tried to be nice to you, but you wouldn't have it that way. Well, you aren't in yet. This is war. Taxi! No, it doesn't matter. Sorry. Funny. I got some cash. Could he have picked my pocket? How are you feeling? Improving, I hope. Oh, the invading bacilli are on the run, and I'm feeling much better, thanks. I'll be right back, Beauregard. Thanks, Brad. You know, I don't believe in any of that stuff. You see, I'm a member of the old school, and the old school's the best school when it comes to this sort of thing. You... Now, if you could only get some Indian herbs and tie them around your neck, that'd do it. Jim Dandy, lickety split. <laughs> but uh, you can't get any Indian herbs these days. So... Oh, what you need is a good hot rum drink. <laughs> he wants to get loaded. <laughs> Countrymen, vice presidents, I come to Barry Bottomley. I have found a secret weapon which will destroy him at last. Beauregard Bottomley has been infallible up to now because his mind is undisturbed. And uh, what I ask you, fellow workers, uh, disturbs a man's mind. Bottomley is looking for perfection in a woman, too. Well, my dear friends, I know of such a perfect creature. Her name is Flame O'Neill. She is a corn-fed Matahari. Her mind is as sharp as a razor's edge. She has everything except a heart. <laughs> And we are exceedingly lucky. She is available now. Her services to my lady soap will go down in history as a shining example of foul play in our time. <laughs> You've a temperature of 95 degrees. 94 degrees. <laughs> I think you're very charming, Frosty, and very considerate to come over and take care of me. Oh, do you really think I'm very charming? I think you're very charming, too. But, well, you're the only man who doesn't pay any attention to me. And I don't like it. Oh, but I do pay attention to you, Frosty. You make it impossible to overlook your many qualities. But you see, you represent the fine arts. I am a man of science. Oh, it sounds beautiful. And kind of dull. Sad. How is Mr. Bottomley this evening? Oh, he's fine, fine. Would you show me to his room, please? He's in there. But you can't go in there. He's sick. Oh. <gasps> Good evening. I'm a present from the Billings, Montana, Beauregard Bottomley Fan Club. What a charming, practical present. Well, they worried so much because of your illness that I... Well, here I am. My name is Flame O'Neill. Slick chick. Oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> you know, it will be difficult to express my appreciation to you and to the fan club, but uh, there's nothing seriously wrong with me. Your pulse is rather rapid. And since it's my responsibility to see to it that you recover, I intend to see that you do recover. Oh, but I assure you, I'm perfectly capable of looking after myself. <clears throat> What's your name, dear? Frosty? <coughs> good night, Frosty. She's a very good friend. How nice. But it is getting late, and the Sandman will soon be here. You nurse. She's charming.
You know, I'm sure there must be a great many people elsewhere who, who need your I, I I never go to sleep before midnight. You don't usually have a cold before midnight either, do you? And I always read myself to sleep. Now, don't be a difficult little boy. Oh, yes, the new Schlesinger book with mine through darkest matter. Interesting, but somewhat violent. You've read that book? You're not the only one who reads these books, Mr. Bottomley. You have to go to bed now, too. I take it you don't agree with Schlesinger. Oh, I share his opinion that mind can influence matter. But I find it very difficult to go along with the theory that in the future we may be able to move concrete objects such as chairs and tables by sheer force of will. Oh, yes, I agree with you. And Schlesinger has a tendency to go overboard. However, from the philosophical approach, Let's you... dispense with Mr. Schlesinger and tuck him in for the night, too, shall we? I I'm afraid we we've no room for you here. Anytime you need me, don't hesitate to call me. Pleasant dreams. Really? Pleasant dreams, indeed. No intention of dreaming. No intention of sleeping. What on earth is she doing out there? And where, where's, where's Gwen? Why am I tucked in? I, I loathe being tucked in. <laughs> you can be stuffed, you know. Flame O'Neill. It's charming. Very well informed. Schlesinger. However, I wish to read. I shall read. going to sleep here? Naturally. Please put out the light. Sorry, I thought you were asleep. I'm not. I would like to be, but I'm not. Sorry. Some water? Uh, well, I, um... <laughs> oh, you aren't really thirsty, are you? Uh, no, I, I'm afraid I'm not. You're such a child. But that's only natural, I suppose. Great men seem to preserve this quality. What is it that really bothers you? Uh, I don't know. Uh, or perhaps, as a bachelor, I'm simply not used to a charming woman sharing my... Try not to think of me as a woman. I think it'd be as a nurse. Uh, of course. Shall I send you a thought block? Good night, Mr. Bottomley. 
Good night, nurse. Would you mind putting out the light, please? Oh, yes, certainly. What are you laughing at? Nothing. <laughs> Something I said or did, perhaps? No, it was nothing, really. Nothing at all. <laughs> it's for fun. One doesn't laugh at nothing, does one? Uh, what I mean is, uh, what does one? But I... I just happened to think of something that struck me as so funny. Uh, what? Oh, I, I couldn't tell you. Really, I couldn't. A question. Yes. Three nights ago, when you entered my life on the wings of mercy, you laughed before you went to sleep. <laughs> Why? Oh, I couldn't possibly tell you. Well, at least of the decency to tell me one thing. Did it concern me? Yes. Hmm. Beauregard, my conscience is bothering me. Why? Well, now that your health is completely restored, I consider it unethical to remain any longer in the employ of the Billings Montana Beauregard Bottomley Fan Club. Yes, but I still don't feel right. You know, when I turn abruptly, my, my back... Can Beauregard, I have a drink it, it, of water? Just on, on the... oh, oh, yes. There we are. Beauregard, this is our last day. Last day? Well, it may be our last day as patient and nurse, but uh, can't we see each other when we're healthy? Oh, but of course I rather hope we'd see each other from time to time. I would miss terribly the brilliance of your wonderful mind. I know, but isn't there something else about me you might miss? What I mean is, um, I admire your mind too, but Thank you. Uh, it doesn't uh, stop there. What is it actually that you mean, Beauregard? Can well, I have a drink of water? Um, uh, well, what I mean, um, uh, no, darling, uh, Gungadin is tired. Run along. Should we run along too? Uh, may I help you? Thanks, Daddy. Flame, I'm a little inarticulate when it comes to this sort of thing, but um, would you have dinner with me tomorrow night at my place? I'd love to. Now it's time for your acetyl salicylic acid. invitation in the mail this morning, so I decided I'd better make other arrangements. I have a date with Happy Hogan. Any objections? There are many objections, but it's silly to repeat them. If you must make a fool of yourself, go ahead. Make a fool of yourself. You know, here. Yeah. Oh, I'm much more generous than you are, Beauregard. I don't object to you making a fool of yourself. Are you comparing my friendship with Flame with your giddy infatuation for Happy Hogan? I am. <laughs> Let me tell you. Comparison is odious and extremely distasteful to me. Hogan is a wise, cracking, treacherous moron. Flame is a charming, cultivated, lovely lady. I doubt her cultivation, and I'm a little wary of the lady's charm. And the rather old routine of the invalid falling in love with the nurse must seem a little corny, even to you, Beauregard. <laughs> but who cares? 
Everybody has to make a few mistakes in this world. And it's nice to see that you've gotten around to making a few yourself. Good night. Eggity, eggity, eggity. Oh, we mustn't be too critical of Gwen, Caesar. When people fall in love, they often act a little foolishly. a certain degree of success already. I've managed to introduce a rather disorganized state of pleasant chaos. He is uncertain, puzzled, upset, and, and bewildered. Of course, of course. All of this has happened to me many times. But it's such a lovely way to become bewildered. Perhaps after all of this is over, you and I can become confused together. You're very lovely. Never mind that. Tomorrow night, I plan to apply the coup de grace. Why not tonight? Because tonight, I have a date with him. I will not show up. Oh, gorgeous, gorgeous. How beautifully nasty. He will not be able to reach me until tomorrow morning. My explanation for breaking the date will be vague and uneasy. He will wonder whether I was out with another man. I will allow him to wonder. He will become angry. Then he will have to ask my forgiveness for being angry. And then, why am I telling you all this? I'm sure you've been through it all many times. Yes. Yes. My only regret is that I didn't think of it sooner. Now Beauregard Bottomley will be pulled down from his proud pinnacle and join the vast army of us men who have been driven nuts by women. Where is she? Why doesn't she? About time. Darling, what happened? Nothing happened, honey. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Would you mind explaining that ho, ho, ho? Ho, ho, ho means ho, ho, ho. Yes, I thought so. And I think it's rude, tactless, and thoroughly suggestive. You're the last man in the world I would have expected to be indiscreet. I begin to get the picture now. Stood up, huh? Right, Gerald. Forgive my bad manners. Excuse me, just a moment. Had your dinner? Yes. Care for another? Yes. Sit down. Hello? Flame, where have you been? What happened to you? Why should anything happen to me? Well, I'm sure I don't know what you're talking about. Well, may I remind you that we had a date for yesterday evening? We had not. We have a date for tonight. We had a date for last night. I remember distinctly. Well, even if I did make a mistake, there's no reason for you to raise your voice. Why didn't you call me? I was at home all evening. I called you 53 times. Maybe I was in the shower. The 53 times I called you were scattered between 8.10 and 12.15. Well, I hope you don't think I was in the shower for four hours. Of course not. But you just said so. I did not. I am never in the shower more than five minutes. Maybe you called the wrong number. That I consider an insult. Flame, I, I really didn't mean to hurt you, darling. <laughs> oh, I, I beg of you. I implore you to stop crying. <laughs> All I did was try to suggest an explanation, and you bit my head off. Why, well, I'm awfully sorry. I, look, I... 
I'll be seeing you tonight, won't I, Flame? I want you to be with me at the broadcast. Maybe it's better that we don't see each other anymore. Our relationship was such a... such a beautiful thing. If one little misunderstanding can create such chaos... Would it be so easy for you, Flame, not to see me anymore? It wouldn't be for me, I assure you. You know it wouldn't be for me either. Be here at eight and don't let's talk about yesterday anymore. Oh, it's awfully sweet of you to forgive me. And please, don't cry anymore. Goodbye. Five minutes in the shower. I called for four hours. Women. All right, let's forget the shower for the time being. One very good reason not to answer the phone is that you don't hear it. When I ask you, don't you hear the telephone? Well, for example, when it's out of order. But the operator said it's in excellent condition. No, there's no explanation that I can find. Except, of course, that you don't hear the telephone when you're not at home. I'll buy that. Come in. I thought perhaps you'd like... Uh... Oh, thank you so much. How sweet of you. I like this so much better than cut flowers. They wilt so fast that one has to throw them away and there's nothing left. Sit down, darling. I'll pour you a lovely martini. Of course, I don't usually drink before the program, but uh, tonight, perhaps. Oh, no. I forgot the program. Your mind must be crystal clear. Yes, tonight, I think I need one. You shouldn't? Yeah, I... Flame, I, I'm a very confused man. Last night, I thought that... We promised each other, Beauregard, not to talk about last night again, didn't we? And we won't. Except that I want you to know I'm terribly sorry I mixed up our date. No, it must have been I who caused the mix-up. In fact, I, I, I know it was. It... Uh, Beauregard, is it because of me that you're confused? Oh, Flame. No, you mustn't. Why mustn't I? Because it's so late and I'll, I'll get my things and be right back. Excuse me. How lovely you are, Stephen. Oh, Beauregard, if you're worried about those roses, please don't be. They come from a very dear old friend of mine, a Dr. Stephen Blandon. He must be at least 70 years old. Very well preserved, 70. You know, Beauregard, I'm, I'm fond of you. Very fond. Aren't you glad to hear that? Very. I've been looking for perfection in the same way that you have, and now at last I've found it. Well, of course, perfection is somewhat of an illusion. And recently I found some weaknesses in my structure. I'd hoped I was the only one. Oh, my dear, against you, of course, I'm utterly helpless, but... As a matter of fact, once before I, uh, I... Another woman? Oh, quite to the contrary. 
Albert Einstein was responsible for it. Albert Einstein? Yes. I couldn't master his space-time continuum theories. Drove me to the brink of a breakdown. But of course you mastered it. Not quite, my dear. Not quite. You like it? Oh, the Greeks had a word for all this, but I can't quite remember it. Don't, Beauregard, don't let's spoil it. Oh, let's spoil it a little, huh? Shall we? No. No. It's all too late. What do you mean, Flame? Is there something you want to tell me? What could I possibly want to tell you? No! Flame! No, no, Flame! Please. That was a close one. What's the difference? You're not interested in what I have to say. Are you in love with this, Stephen? Love? <laughs> For normal people. Oh, Flame, what are you talking about? I can't tell you. Because if I tell you, I'd lose you, and I, and I can't afford to lose you. I hope you don't! Oh. With you. Oh, what should be the matter with me? Am I cross-eyed or something? I wish you wouldn't make me nervous. Oh, it's nothing, really. Just, just a little misunderstanding. Oh, uh, uh, would you please introduce me to this gentleman? Oh, yes, Miss O'Neill, Mr. Hogan. Oh, regard. What? Flame, this is not Happy Hogan. It is Mr. Waters. Oh. How do you do? Very well, I'm sure. Uh, will you excuse me, please? This is the payoff. This is the end of Beauregard Bottomley. Tonight, you and I will celebrate. I'll drink champagne out of your typewriter. I'm so sorry, but here are six cakes of my lady soap. The soap that sanctifies. Good night. Hello. Oh, you must be flame. Any relative of Mr. and Mrs. Blaze at Fire Island? Why, Beauregard, why have you told me all those nasty things about Hogan? I think he's I... terribly attractive. Of course I am. He used to call me gorgeous Hogan when I was wrestling. Really? Stick around, kid. I'll be back for more of the same. That exhibition was disgraceful. But I can't help person. myself, I tell you. I can't help myself. It's stronger than I. I, I. I lied to you. I had a date with you. I knew it. I, but I had to break it. I couldn't help myself because Stephen is just like Hogan. What is Hogan? Hogan? Hogan is just like Bill. Bill. And Bill is just Whoosh. like Jim. And Jim... Shh. I, I can't Why? resist them. I'm Why? like honey in their hands. Me? These men... Boy, God, strong, God. handsome, God. brutal, devil-make hair. God. My lady, my lady, my lady, oh, my Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. The moment you've all been waiting for. All over America, streets are deserted as radio sets, television consoles, and theater screens are flashing this program from coast to coast. By shortwave radio, all the world is waiting for these next few seconds when Beauregard Bottomley will be shooting for the unbelievable sum of $20 million or nothing. Hurry, Beauregard. Beauregard. They're waiting for you on the show. Oh, what, what show? Oh, yeah, yes, of course, yes. Who is that girl? I've seen her before somewhere. Oh, come on. I can't hear you unless you stop the music. Stop the music? You got the wrong program, bud. Say, do you feel all right? Oh, yes, fine, thank you. And you? Well, here we go. Are you ready? 
Hey, I said, are you ready? What? Oh, yes, I, I remember. I, I think so. Here it is. How does Einstein regard the space-time continuum? Well, we're running out of time. You want to make a stab at it? You have just five seconds. Come on and try it. One, two, three, four. He imagines the continuum to be cylindrical as regards its extension in time, but spherical as regards its extension in space, so that cross-sections at different instants always give a spherical universe of constant size and so of constant mass. I'm sorry, but that's incorrect. Oh, 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 oh it's mine. Oh, mine as far as the eye can see. Tough luck, old man. But anyway, here are six cakes of my lady's soap. I was almost sure that was the right answer. <laughs> Where's Flame? Gone, I suppose. Full regard. I'm awfully sorry. Really, I am. Listen to them yelling for you. They want you out no, there. Come no, 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 no. Do this for me, please. Got... You must do it. Hello? What? Princeton, New Jersey? Who's calling? Oh, yes, a Professor Einstein for Happy Hogan. Have this switched to the stage phone. What does he want? Important call for you, Happy. Hello, Happy Hogan speaking. Yes, sir. Who? Oh, yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We will, sir. Thank you very much, Professor Einstein. Is it bad? Everything that comes from Einstein is relative. Bad for you? Good for Beauregard. Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Einstein has just called from Princeton to tell us that Beauregard Bottomley's answer was correct. <laughs> Mr. Waters. Who called? Oh, then you mean Beauregard is still... Oh, I'm so glad. Uh, just a minute, there's somebody at the door. Beauregard! Well, if, if, if you'd only give me a chance to explain, I...
Somebody's killing her. She's killing somebody. Maybe somebody in see her killing somebody else. Miss O'Neill is having bottomly trouble. Sit down. Instead of sitting, may I lean? Certainly. Now, there is no Stephen, is there? And you bought the roses for yourself. You're not neurotic, spellbound, in the grip of brutal men. Only one. Yes, well, never mind that. I must congratulate you to destroy me with such beautiful torture showed real genius. Well, it was Waters' idea originally. Ah, but the execution was exquisite. Thank you, Beauregard. I did the worst I could. Yes, I'm sure you did. I remember the night you arrived. When I laughed in my sleep. Yes, it twisted my mind. It was effective, wasn't it? It was delicious agony. Were you also pretending when I kissed you? Oh, you're wonderful, Beauregard. I'm ashamed of myself. Yes, you ought to be, definitely. But, uh, you know, uh, to be frank, I should be a little ashamed, too. Why? Well, because I tricked you just as you tricked me. You see, I became a little suspicious. Your timing was too good, your scenes too perfect. Is that so? Yes, and your confession's too pat. You mean to say I didn't drive you mad? Oh, yes, yes, of course you did. I fell in love with you madly, despite my suspicions. But, uh, nevertheless, I... Beauregard, do you mean that you purposely let me know about your weaknesses for, for Einstein's theories? It just so happens, my dear, that I spend an entire season with Einstein, working my way through a maze of logarithms. I love you. That's just one of the most dishonest things I ever heard of in my whole life. I don't know whether I shall ever forgive you. Why did this have to happen to me? I'm a good man. Do you know what they called me in college? Sky blue waters. That's right. <laughs> no, that's not right. They called me dirty waters. And they were right. Dirty waters. That's why I went into the soap business. But he hasn't won yet. You've still got a week to go. Yes, you're right, my dear. You're absolutely right. One long week of misery. Well, there's so little you can do, Mr. Waters. Yes, yes, but I can go down in a blaze of glory. Like Hamlet sought the poison dagger. Like Mark Anthony fell upon his sword. I, too, will seek oblivion. Next week's show will be the last show for everything. Forty million dollars. Book the Hollywood Bowl. Thousands and thousands of people. Fanfare and pageantry. The Twilight of the Gods. Valhalla. And then like Romeo and Juliet, you and I will die together. You're nuts. <laughs> in. How is everything? Uh, or perhaps I should say, how will everything be? Mr. Bottomley, I know that you're a non-believer. Oh. Nevertheless, I must warn you about the future. I, I'd appreciate it much more if you tell me something about Caesar's past. Oh, please listen to him, Beauregard. He's really wonderful. And he's so upset about what he saw on the crystal ball. Indeed, I am. To begin with, there will be an unusual turn of events. That is correct. And furthermore, the trouble in the family. That's right. But uh, all these difficulties will be finally overcome. No, they will not, Mr. Bottomley. Not only that, you will not answer the last question. Oh, my dear medium, your, your crystal ball needs a new windshield wiper. Have you ever been a bridesmaid, Frosty? You and Happy Hogan are going to be married. I'm so happy. That's yes, Frosty. I don't blame you for crying, my dear. Please, Beauregard, try and see this my way. Gwen, I haven't racked my brains and tortured my mind to drive Hogan off the air, only to wind up with him at home. You don't have to live with us, Beauregard. Uh, you'll have difficulty living with yourself. 
Hogan didn't ask you to become his wife without being sure he married into a $40 million family. And when did he suggest the wedding should take place? Before or after the Hollywood Bowl? The day after. Hello, Happy. This is good. Darling, I feel the same way. And there's really no sense in our waiting. Let's get married right away. Let's go to Las Vegas now, right now. Oh, I see. All right, we'll, we'll wait if that's the way you want it. I know you're busy, darling. It's just that I... What isn't important, really? No, we'll wait, darling. Bye-bye. Any questions? Oh, Gwen. There's no reason to be unhappy. You'll have everything you want. The only thing I want in the world is happy Hogan. I know, but you will discover many new and beautiful things. You'll be able to travel. You'll be able to travel all over the world if you wish. And when you come back, I know you're going to be very happy living with Flame and me. Flame? Uh, yes, Gwen. She has promised to be Mrs. Beauregard Bottomley. Are you out of your mind? She's explained everything. And you fell for that like a, a nincompoop. That female... Benedict Arnold. I resent that. I resent your calling me a nincompoop. When did she suggest that the wedding should take place? Before or after the ball? Hello, darling. Hello. Yes, of course I love you. So much so that I will be at your house in approximately 46 minutes. We will then motor to Las Vegas. We will arrive at dawn, and by the time we've had breakfast, we will be husband and wife. Hmm? True, sir. Fittings. Wedding gown. Yes, 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 I, I see. Oh, well, then I guess we just have to wait. Uh, uh, goodbye, dear.
see here. The show is going on. This way, Mr. Bottomley. Thank you. Oh. How do you do? In your case, quite well. You've been following me around for a very long time. To put it bluntly, Mr. Bottomley, you belong to us now. I belong. Would you mind telling me who you people are? Department of Internal Revenue. You know, income tax. Oh, oh. oh yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we thought you were gangsters. Yes, that's right. Uh, how much of him belongs to you? Let's say that Mr. Bottomley is in a battleship class. Oh. Let us know when you pick up the money, won't you? But why not stay and pick it up for me? We practically will. Well, good luck to us. Sure. <laughs> good luck to us, too. It means an awful lot to you whether I win or lose, doesn't it? Of course, darling. Think how $40 million will look in our piggy bank. Yes, indeed it will. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure at this time to present a man you all know, you all love, and you all laugh with. I mean none other than Happy Hogan. <laughs> Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The historic event is about to begin. It looks like closing night for Masquerade for Money. I would sincerely like to know who my next sponsor is going to be, if any. <laughs> <laughs> However, I have a sponsor, at least for the next half hour, and I'd like to present him to you now. The captain of our stricken bark, a self-made man, a man who arrived in Los Angeles as a barefoot boy has a good chance of leaving tomorrow morning as a barefoot man, Burnbridge Waters. May the best man lose. Century, the man who knows everything, Super Brain Bottomley. Beauregard, in one moment you will be asked a question, the answer to which will determine whether you are worth $40 million or nothing. Of course, you can still take your $20 million and go home. No, thank you. Are you ready? Quite ready. Do you have your wallet with you? May I have it? Here is your question. Beauregard Bottomley, what is your social security number? Well, of course, nothing could be simpler. My social security number is 452-1... <clears throat> no, wait a moment, 542. No, no, 245, that's right. 245-17... Dash 6012. That is absolutely wrong. Well, it looks as though you were right. Though I was right, too. Uh -huh. Oh, you're horrible. An hour ago, you lost $40 million. Flame certainly left in a hurry. I consider it one of the greatest virtues to take defeat with dignity.
Good evening. Good evening. What's this? Champagne. Champagne for Caesar. The beginning of a lifelong supply. <coughs> Dirty waters. Good heavens, where have you been? <coughs> Champagne. Oh, you lovely, lovely bird. We were roommates in college together. Oh, so you're the one that taught him all these expressions. <laughs> you. Happy. Oh, darling. Aren't you going to wish us good luck? Well, you're obnoxious, but not quite as obnoxious as I thought you were. Hello? Flame. Darling, aren't you packed and ready? If you don't hurry, we'll never have breakfast in Las Vegas. You don't know how ready I am. Oh, goodbye. <laughs> Let's get loaded. Don't worry, we will. Ours. No! Oh, Beauregard, it's beautiful. Why, where did it come from? A wedding gift from a very generous Burnbridge Waters. Generous? Huh? Burnbridge Waters? Those two don't quite seem to go together. You know, I don't understand any of this at all. Yeah, it's unbelievable, isn't it? And this isn't all. I have my own radio program, a bit of stock, and a few other small considerations. Did you make a deal with Dirty Waters? Did you agree to answer the last question wrong on purpose? Oh, darling, you did it all because of me, didn't you? You want to find out if I really loved you. Oh, you gorgeous fool. Gorgeous, yes, but I wasn't such a fool after all. I must confess, I didn't know my social security number. No. May I kiss you properly, darling? I promise not to upset you. Well, that's hardly possible, my sweet, but you can go ahead and try. What are these? Oh, books. What for? But I always read myself to sleep, darling. Remember? <laughs> <laughs> 